In honor of all the moms in our, in our congregation here today, I want to read something entitled The Evolution of Motherhood. And I want to see if you can relate with this. Here it is. First of all, preparing for birth. The first baby, you practice your breathing religiously. Second baby, you don't bother practicing because you remember that last time breathing didn't do a thing. Third baby, you ask for an epidural in the eighth month. Is anybody relate with that? Here, as far as worries go, first baby at the first sign of distress, a whimper, a frown, anything, you pick the baby up. Second baby, you pick the baby up when his or her wails threaten to wake your firstborn. Third baby, you teach your three-year-old how to wind up the mechanical swing. Right? When it comes to pacifier, with the first baby, if the pacifier falls on the floor, you put it away until you can go home and sanitize it. Right? Second baby, when the pacifier falls on the floor, you squirt it off with some juice from the baby's bottle. Right? Third baby, you wipe it off on your shirt and pop it back in. Comes the diapering of the first baby. You change your baby's diapers every hour whether they need it or not. Second baby, you change their diaper every two to three hours if needed. Third baby, you try to change their diaper before others start to complain about the smell or, they see, or you see it sagging to their knees. On going out with the first baby, the first time you leave your baby with a, with a babysitter, you call home five times just to make sure everything's okay. With the second baby, just before you walk out the door, you remember, oh, I better leave a number with the babysitter where you can be reached. With the third baby, you leave instructions for the sitter to call only if there is blood, right? <laughs> and then when you're at home, with the first baby, you spend a good bit of every day just gazing at the baby. The second baby, you spend a good bit of every day watching your older child to make sure they're not squeezing, poking, or hitting the baby. With the third baby, you spend a good uh, bit of time every day hiding from your children. Can I get an amen? amen. Jason's saying amen <laughs> like he knows. I read a story this week uh, about a, a man who found a lamp by the side of the road and you know, having seen such things in movies, he thought uh, he'd pick it up and he began rubbing it. And sure enough, out popped the genie. And the genie popped out and said, I'm going to give you one wish. And the man sat there for a while and he thought about it. He, he said, if I'm only going to get one, I'm going to make it a good one. So, so he, uh, he finally thought it over. He says, okay, here's what I want. I want a spectacular job, one in which no man has ever succeeded. And the genie nodded and said, poof, you're a mom. Read a poem that reminded me of a poem I read about mothers. It says, She cooked the breakfast first of all, washed the cups and plates, dressed the children and made sure stockings all were mates, combed their hair and made their beds, sent them out to play, gathered up their motley toys, put some books away, dusted chairs and mopped the stairs, ironed an hour or two, baked a jar of cookies and a pie, then made a pot of stew. The telephone rang constantly, the doorbell did the same. A youngster fell and stubbed his toe, and then the laundry came. She picked up blocks and mended socks, she, then she polished up the stove. And when her husband came at six, he said, I envy you. It must be nice to sit at home without a thing to do. That was a, a dead man right there. <laughs> Listen, the truth is being a mom is just hard work. Isn't that true? There's a lot of joy. I'm not saying that. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of joy and great satisfaction, but it is plain hard work because mothers are teachers. They are disciplinarians. Mothers are sometimes gardeners and mowers of lawns. The mothers are nurses and doctors and psychologists and counselors and chauffeurs and coaches. Mothers are developers of personalities, molders of vocabularies and shapers of attitudes. Mothers are soft voices saying, I love you. Mothers are a link to God and a child's first impression of God's love. Mothers are all of these th things and so much more. You know, one of her columns, Irma Bombeck, I don't know how many of you remember Irma Bombeck. She's been gone for a while now, but she tells a, uh, a fictional story about God in the act of creating mothers. And this is what she wrote. She said, when the Lord, good Lord was creating mothers, he was into the sixth day of overtime when the angel appeared and said, you're doing a lot of fiddling around on this one. And the Lord said, have you, have you read the specs on this, on this order? She has to be completely washable, but not plastic. Have, have 180 movable parts, all replaceable. 
She has to run on black coffee and leftovers, have a lap that disappears when she stands up, a kiss that can cure anything from a broken leg to a, a disappointed love affair, and six pairs of hands. And the angel shook her head slowly and said, six pairs of hands, no way. It's not the hands that are causing me problems, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes that mothers have to have. That's on the standard model, asked the angel. The Lord nodded one pair that sees through closed doors when she asked, what are you kids doing in there when she already knows? Another here on the back of her head that sees what she shouldn't, but she has to know. And of course, the pair up, up in front that can look at a child when he goofs up and say, I understand and I love you without so much as uttering a word. Lord, said the angel, just, just go to bed. Tomorrow, I can't, said the Lord. I'm so close to creating something so close to myself. Already I have one who heals herself when she is sick, can feed a family of six on one pound of hamburger, and can get a nine-year-old to stand under a shower. The angel circled the model of the mother very slowly. It's too soft, she sighed, but tough said the Lord excitedly. You, you can't imagine what this mother can do or endure. Can it think? Not only think, it, but it can reason and compromise, said the creator. Finally, the angel bent over and ran her finger across the cheek. There's a leak, she pronounced. I told you you were trying to put too much into this model. It's not a leak, said the Lord. It's a tear. What's it for? Well, it's for joy. Sadness, disappointment, pain, loneliness, and pride. You are a genius, said the angel. And the Lord looked somber. I didn't put it there. You know, maybe with all this in mind, we can, maybe we can better understand Mrs. Zebedee. You know who Mrs. Zebedee was? Mrs. Zebedee was the mother of James and John. I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 20, a short uh, paragraph, a little story that most of you have already heard. But it says this, it says, Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, In your kingdom, will you let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one at your right and the other at your left? But Jesus told them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of sorrow I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. I find it very interesting that she was asking, but they were obviously there because now they're speaking up. Oh, yeah, we can do that. You will indeed drink, drink from it, he told them, but I have no right to say who will sit on the thrones next to mine. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. You know, Mrs. Zebedee was very aware of the teachings of Jesus about his kingdom, and she was also very, very aware of the fact that her sons, James and John, were, were two-thirds of the, of the inner circle that were close to Jesus. There, were, uh, James, uh, there was James and John and Peter that made up the inner circle that were closest to Jesus, and she knew that her sons were there. And so in, in light of that, it, 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 she was certain that when, when the Lord formed his kingdom, she was sure that, that they would have positions of responsibility and authority. Nevertheless, in the, in the first part of this chapter, Jesus told a story that must have really disturbed her and got her thinking about things a little bit. It was a story about a landowner who went out to find laborers early in the morning and, and they, they agreed on a fair day's wage and they started working. Then at noon, the landowner went out and found more recruits and, and they started working. And then later in the evening, he went out and found even more laborers and they started working. Yet when the end of the day came and the, 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 the Lord of the harvest began to pay those workers, he paid them off at the end of the day and they all received the exact same amount of wages. And that must have caused Mrs. Zebedee to wonder, will my sons really have positions of authority in the Lord's new kingdom? Because they've been with him from the beginning. What if so, he gives this to somebody else? Consequently, when the opportunity presented itself, she came to the Lord Matthew says she bowed before him and made this request. In your kingdom, will you let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left? And you know, it'd be very easy for us to criticize her, begin to, to, to say, oh, she's just like a, a stage mom, just pushing her kids, you know, always trying to move her kids to the front of the line. And it'd be easy for us to criticize her for presumptuousness. But, you know, since today is Mother's Day, Maybe we ought to just think for a few minutes concerning some positive things about Mrs. Zebedee. 
Now, now what are some good things about her? First of all, here, here's some good things. First of all, she prayed that her sons might be part of Jesus' kingdom. That's a good thing. You know, as we said earlier, being a parent is not easy. Sometimes, and many times, it's filled with joy and, and, and filled with unbelievable uh, uh, satisfaction. And there's just an amazing joy. But other times, it's, there's, there's great sadness when you're a parent. And sometimes your children make you so proud that you just, you know, want to pop your buttons. And sometimes they make them so mad that you, you you're so mad that you just want to pop them. You know what I'm saying? Anybody here? I'm, 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 I'm confessing here to you. No, my girls are good. Um, they, they probably feel like popping me more than I feel like popping them. You know, other times, you know, it's just so tough that you just can't find enough Kleenexes to, to dry the, the, the tears. And the difficulty of motherhood, you know, wh- one good part, thing about that is, is that it drives many moms to pray. You know, many, many times moms pray out of necessity, right? Uh, because you just don't know what else to do. Sometimes they pray because, because, you know, it's just not easy. It's so extremely difficult that they get to the end of the rope and they begin to pray in ways that they never thought they'd pray before. You know, I remember a story from uh, when Abby, our youngest daughter, was a, just a tiny little baby. Uh, the, the first year that she was born, she, she went through a rough patch where every night she began to cry inconsolably. You know, we don't know if it was colic or something like that, but... But it was still like clockwork. Every night she just began to cry. And there was nothing that anybody could do. And, uh, and, and so that was going on. Well, during that time, during the year that she was born, was the year that I was working on my master's degree at Southeastern University in Florida. And so every month I had to fly from Reno, Nevada to Florida for a week for classes. And this was during that year. I'll just tell you right now, my wife Julie just carried an incredible load because as I was doing that and, and pastoring the church at the same time, that you know, it just takes a lot of time. And she, she made it possible for me to do that. But one of those weeks when I was in Florida for classes, one night, just like clockwork, Abby started crying. And, and, and Julie was trying everything that, that, that she could think of, everything that she could do to calm her, to soothe her, to get her to stop crying. And nothing worked. I mean, she... Abby did not slow down, did not pause for a second. If anything, every time she tried something, she would just, just you know, double up her efforts in her wailing, you know. And so Julie, you know, she was just exhausted. She was frustrated. This was in the wee hours of the morning. She hadn't really been asleep because of all this going on, hadn't, hadn't had much sleep. And, and, and she was, in that moment, she was so exhausted, frustrated, she just blurted out, how many of you know that, that God is not offended when out of our frustration, we cry out to him and let him know that we're frustrated. You know, you're not frustrated. You're not offended when, you're, when your kids do, and he's not either. But she finally reached the end of her rope, and she just said out loud in the most simple prayer. She said, God, you promised you would help me. Why are you not? And I mean, just that frustration. And in that moment, a thought came into her mind. And that thought said, go into the bathroom and turn on the shower. She thought, well, that's a little bit odd. But she decided, you know, because she's so sensitive to the Lord, she just decided, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And she walked in there and she turned on the shower. And as soon as the water started uh, running, Abby stopped crying. And she, it was funny because she thought, is this a coincidence? So she turned the water off and she started crying, turned it on again, and she stopped crying. And, and it was just an amazing thing. But, you know, the reason, it, it, the, being a mom and the difficulty that is what drove her to that prayer of desperation. And that's what it does in our lives. And that's a, that's a, that's a really a good side of motherhood that in the difficulties it causes you to, be, to pray. And sometimes being a mom will cause you to pray, won't it? But she gives us a, value example, a valuable example for, for how she prayed because she didn't just pray for her kids, but she prayed that her sons specifically would be part of Jesus' kingdom. And you know, we as parents, moms, we, you, you need to have the same concern for your children. I want you to know this. There are a lot of responsibilities that mom, moms have. You know, there are an incredible number of of responsibilities, things that moms have to do, they have to take care of. It's on their plate. This is what they need to do. But I want you to know this. There is no more important task of motherhood than to lead your children to Jesus. 
There's nothing more important than that. Do all that you can to ensure that your children are part of the kingdom of God. You, you teach them with your words. You teach them with your actions. Show them who Jesus is by the way that you live. Lead your children to Jesus. Now, notice it's lead your children to Jesus. Don't send them to Jesus. You know, uh, I get frustrated when parents send their kids to church, but they don't come themselves because because they're really teaching them by their example. It doesn't matter what they're doing or what they're having their kids do, but what they're teaching their kids when they do that, they're teaching their kids when you get old enough, you don't need God. But lead your children to Jesus. You know, what good is it, what good is it if our children are successful in life but don't know God? How, what good is it if our children are successful in making money and become the wealthiest, maybe they become the wealthiest person in the entire world, but they lose out with God? What, what good is all that? What good is it if our children drive fine cars and live in upscale neighborhoods if they don't know Jesus? What does it matter if they gain the whole world but lose their own souls? You know, I can tell you as a father, I have a lot of hopes and dreams for my, my two little girls. They're not so little anymore, but they're always little to me. But, uh, you know, I have lots of hopes, lots of dreams, lo lots of things I love to see them do and become. But the most important thing I pray for is that they will grow up to know and to love Jesus. That they will grow up to serve him. So pray that your children will be saved. That's, that's what really matters. Pray that they will know and love Jesus. And that, that's the place to begin for, with your prayers. Second thing, good thing about Mrs. Ebony was this. She prayed that her sons would be involved in the work of Jesus' kingdom. Not only did she pray that her sons would be part of the kingdom, but she prayed that they would be actively involved in the work of, of his kingdom. You see, it's not enough just to be saved. You know, the, the fact is churches are full of people content just to fill a pew on, on a Sunday morning. There are plenty of people who are willing to sit back and receive the blessings and listen to the messages and enjoy the music. But, but there aren't many people who are willing to get involved in doing any of the real work of the church. But here's the question. Where does an attitude of service begin? Well, an attitude of service begins at home with the example of the mothers and fathers. That's where it begins. But which, by the way, you know, I, I had, a, I had a, a pastor I worked with, Pastor Ted Britton, and he used to say all the time, and uh, it stuck with me over the years, he said, he would tell parents, he said, listen, you need to know this. Children learn in three ways. Three ways. This is how they learn. Number one, example. Number two, example. Number three, example. That's how they learn. And a mother's example is enormously powerful because you, you have an impact on, on that child's life like nobody else. Reminds me of a mother who was preparing for a large Christmas Eve family uh, gathering and she had, she had been barking out orders like a drill sergeant. You know, pick up your things. Don't get your clothes dirty. You put away those toys. Do just one order after another. And her four-year-old daughter had been kind of underfoot all day. You know, that's what four-year-olds do. They, they like to be there in the middle of all of it. They're right in the middle of everything and in the way and underfoot. And so finally she sent her, her four-year-old daughter into the next room. And she said, go play with the nativity set. They had a wooden nativity set that she knew she wouldn't mess up, wouldn't break. And so the mom just kept kind of scurrying around and working on getting everything done. And, and, uh, and as she was working uh, there and she began setting the table, she overheard her daughter in the next room and her daughter was talking in the same tone of voice that the mother had used. How many of you have ever, have ever heard your children say something and you realize, oh, that was me. That's me. That's what happened to her. She heard her daughter talking in the same tone of voice and this is what her daughter was saying. She was saying, I don't care who you are. Get those camels out of my living room. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that. But you know, a child begins to develop a servant's heart by watching the example of his or her parents. Because an attitude of service is caught, not taught. You don't teach someone how to serve. You show them how to serve. Mom and dad, if you want your children to be involved in the work of God's kingdom, then make sure that you're involved in the work of God's kingdom. That's, that's the key right there. You know, in, in addition to setting an example of service, 
Mothers and fathers need to take that next step because we start by setting the example. But the second thing we do is we pray, God, I pray that you would move my child into your service. Take my child and put him where you want in the kingdom. Put her wherever you want her to serve. Use her in any, any, any way that you want. Take him anywhere in the world that you want to take him. Use him, Lord God. Let him be involved in the kingdom. And that's what Mrs. Zebedee was, was praying. when She prayed that her children would be, would be actively involved in the work of the kingdom. And we need to follow her example. And we need mothers and fathers that are praying that their sons and their daughters would be involved in the work of the kingdom. We need moms and dads willing to pray that their children would be the ones who will go out into the world and reach the lost with the love and compassion of Jesus. We need parents who will be willing to say, Lord, I'm scared to let my child go to the mission field, but God, if that's where you want to take her, if that's where you want to take him, I will let you take him wherever you want, to, want her to go because if it's dangerous, I can trust you to take care of her. But Lord, use my child, use my child to build the kingdom, to pray. Well, here's the third thing that was good about Mrs. Zebedee. That was that she had big dreams and expectations for her children. And I, I like that. I like that. She didn't just pray, God, let my two sons be doorkeepers in your kingdom. She wanted them to be on the right and the left hand of Jesus. And when you're in a kingdom and a monarchy like that, there are no higher positions than those on the right and the left hand of the king. And that's what she wanted for her sons. Now, now, some may consider Mrs. Zebedee brash and presumptuous, and maybe she was to a degree, but in, in a lot of ways, I kind of admire her because, you know, the, the thing is too often what we have done is we have settled for mediocrity in the church. You know, for too long, we, we have been content with just barely making it through the door. For too long, we've been content to just sit back and, and let things happen. And it's time, listen, it's time for some of us to take our positions at the right and the left hand to become leaders, to, to begin molding the outreach of the church, to begin mobilizing to make sure the message of Christ goes into the entire world. It's time to strive for excellence. Now, listen, excellence is not the top-notch you know, goal. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is faithfulness. But at the same time, while we're being faithful, we want to offer our very best. We want to give the best that we have to him, and we know that our best is not enough. Anybody, how do you, anybody here know your best is not good enough? Any, besides me. Okay, there's uh, most of us here. The rest of you, uh, we need to have a talk. Uh, but uh, but we know it's not enough. And so we offer our very best, though, knowing it's not enough. And we say, God, I want to do something significant for your kingdom. It's time to, to do that. It's time to reach for the very best that God has for us. God calls us to be his disciples. And he calls us to be effective laborers in the kingdom. But in light of that, listen, I want you to understand the power of a mother's words. Because as, you, as, you're, as God begins to move on your child, he, he created your child with a purpose. While he was in your womb, while she was in your womb, he was molding that child and preparing that child and giving that child the, the gifts and abilities and the personality that he or she was going to need. He was doing that all with a, a, a specific purpose of saying, I'm going to create this child because this is my plan for this child. This is what I want to do with this child and through this child. And in the middle of all that, what, can, what we have to understand is while, while God has given us this primary, as parents, the primary stewardship responsibility of, of leading our children to Jesus and encouraging, the, encouraging them to find their place in the kingdom, their place of service, your words, especially as a mom, a mother's words can, can encourage and inspire her children or they can discourage and deflate her children. You, you hold, hold the power in your hands when, when God begins to call that child, your, your words will echo, echo in their minds and in their memories, and it is in that moment they will, that they will either say, no, there's no way I could do that, or yes, God, I believe that you're calling me. You know, someone once said, mothers write the words, or excuse me, mothers write on the hearts of their children what the world's rough hands cannot erase. Don't ever forget the, the tremendous impact you have on your kids. Listen to what some of these great men have said about their mothers. When I was a child, my mother said to me, if you become a soldier, you'll be a general. 
If you become a monk, you'll end up as the Pope. Instead, I became a painter and wound up as Picasso. George Washington said the greatest teacher I ever had was my mother. And Abraham Lincoln, great man, said all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. Speak words of encouragement to your children. Let your children know that you believe in them. Let your children know that you believe in God's plan for their life. Tell them, speak to your children. I don't know if you've never done this before. It may seem strange at first, but the more you do it, the more natural it will become. But tell your children that they were born to be world changers for God. Speak that into their lives. Let them hear you say that you really believe that. It'll impact their lives. I remember a time in my life when, uh, before I... uh, before I met Julie, long before I met Julie, I was a young man, hadn't even gone to college yet, to Bible college, and I remember I was really struggling, I was really hurting, really feeling really down on myself, and I can remember my mom, I was talking to my mom, she was at work, and I was talking with her over the phone, and and I don't even remember what the conversation was really about, I just know that there was some sort of argument, I was upset about something, and we were having this kind of Uh, sort of semi-heated exchange, this argument over the phone. And in in the middle of that phone call with all this going on, all of a sudden she abruptly changed the tone of the conversation and she just, she out of nowhere to me, she said, David, what's wrong? I mean, just caught me off guard. She, She sensed that we were talking about something that wasn't really the issue. And so I I told her, you know, I just kind of in that moment that kind of caught me off guard and I let my guard down and I told her what I was thinking, that how I thought I was nothing and how I couldn't do anything right and all these things that were going through my mind. And she just sat there on the other end of the phone and listened for for a few minutes, listened to me wallow in my self-pity because that's all it was. I was just having my little pity party. And she was just sat there and patiently listened and she didn't rebuke me for all the silly things I was saying. But in, after listening for just a few moments, she just very, very calmly just said this. She said, oh, David, you have so much going for you. No one will ever know the massive impact those few words have had on my life. I realized in that moment that my mom believed in me and that helped me believe that God could really use me. Speak words of encouragement into the lives of your children and those words will impact them forever. You know, today is a very special day because we recognize that a mother's love serves as a living example of God's love. It's a, it's a love that, that literally goes through the valley of the shadow of death to bring that life into being. It's a love that sacrifices itself over and over and over again. It's a love that would, would, would willingly, without a second thought, lay down its life for, their own, for her own children. The story is told of Solomon Rosenberg and his family. It's a true story. During the Holocaust of World War II, Solomon Rosenberg and his wife, along with their two sons and his mother and his father, were arrested and they were placed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a labor camp, and the rules were very, very simple. As long as you could do your work, then you were permitted to live. But but when you became too weak to do your work, then you would be exterminated. Well, Rosenberg watched over time and watched his mother and his father marched off to their deaths. He knew that his youngest son, David, would be next because he had always been a frail child. Every evening, Rosenberg would come back to the barracks after his hours of labor and and he would search for the faces of his family. When he, when he found them, they would, they would huddle together, embrace one another, and thank God for another day of life. And one day, Rosenberg came back, and he didn't see all those familiar faces. He finally discovered his oldest son, Joshua, huddled in a corner, weeping and, and crying. And, and he said, Joshua, tell me it's not true. And Joshua turned and said, it's true, Papa. Today, David was not strong enough to do his work, so they came for him. But where is your mother, he said. Oh, Papa. Oh, Papa, he said, when they came for David, he was so afraid and he cried. And Mama said, there's nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him. That is motherhood. 
That's the heart of a mother that says, I will lay my life down for the sake of my children. And that is a reflection of the heart of God. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? So mom, your heart for your children is, 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 the, is the heart of God reflected through the love of you as a mother. I want all of our, all of our moms that are here just to, just to stand, if you could, would. Moms at home, you don't have to stand, I guess, but uh, everybody knows who you are anyway. Mothers, today is your day. And this is the weirdest Mother's Day ever, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's the, it is. It's just the strangest time but it's still your day. And, you know, some of you, some of you have young children still at home. And, and I want to pray for you because you are fulfilling the, fulfilling the greatest ministry that God has given, ever given to you or ever will give to you. And that's the ministry of being a mom. Others of you have children who have already learned from your example how, how to follow Christ, but they've, but they've gone astray. They're they're, they're the prodigal that's out there wandering and you're, you're worried about them. I want to encourage you today, don't ever give up. Keep on praying, keep on loving, keep on setting a godly example. And I, I want to pray with you that your do joy would be complete knowing that your entire family is serving God. And you know, on Mother's Day, it's a hard day because there are some, I know there's some in our church that, that uh, it's hard because you've lost your mom. I want to pray for you too because this is a tough day. Not only that, there are some in our church as well that want to be a mom and haven't been able to. I want to pray that God would comfort you, not only that, but that he will give you the child. We've walked, Julie and I walked down that road for 12 years, and I know God can do miracles. So I want to pray for you. You know, I would like to call you up here, but I can't. We've got to keep our distance. But right where you are, I just want to pray for you that on this day, that you would just feel honored. I, I honor you. Thank you for reflecting the heart of God. Thank you for loving your children. Thank you for being a tool in the hands of God to direct your children to Him. And I wanna pray that you'll be, you'll, you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit to lead your children to Jesus. Not only that, I wanna pray that you'll be empowered to let go of your children so that Jesus can take them wherever he wants them to go. But, but I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that uh, you, you would touch every mom. I know this is a very, very strange Mother's Day, and there are some moms that can't even gather with their kids because of all that's going on. And Lord, I pray that, that, that whatever is lacking in this moment, Lord God, that you would fill it by the power of your Spirit. Lord, I pray for all the moms with small children, children that are still at home. I pray, God, that you would anoint them and use them, God. They are fulfilling the greatest ministry that they could possibly imagine, the ministry of being a mom. And I pray, Lord, you'd give them wisdom and give them patience and give them strength. And God, I pray that you would anoint them and help them to lead their children to Jesus, God. And, and Lord, help them, give them the strength to be able to let go of their kids and say, Lord, wherever you want them to go, Lord, I want you to use them. And God, that they would lead their children to serve your kingdom by setting that example. And Lord, there are other moms here that, are, that their children are grown, they're out of the home, and they know what's right, but God, they're, they're struggling, they've wandered away from you, and I pray, God, that you would just let them hear that still small voice calling them home and that God, that you would bring that prodigal home. And Lord, when they do, let that be a, a day of rejoicing like, like that mom has never seen before. Lord, there are some that have, that are, that are, this is a bittersweet day because their mom is gone. And I pray, Lord, that you would comfort their hearts and they would, they would know, Lord God, that uh, they would, they would know your, your, your healing power in their hearts for those that are that are hurting on Mother's Day because they want to be a mom and they haven't been able to God I'm asking that you do a miracle a physical miracle in their bodies that you would you would give them the 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 the, the great desire of their heart and Lord I pray that in Jesus name 
that on this day that we honor our moms, that we would take some time to reflect the fact that it's really a picture of your love for us. And in the same way that a mom lays down her life every single day for her kids, she puts her kids before herself. That's what you've done for us. And so, Lord, we're, th we're thankful, we're grateful, Lord God, for the, for the gift of your son. And I pray, Lord, if there's anybody that has never made the decision to follow you, I pray, God, that today would be the day that they would just pray a simple prayer of surrender and, and confession of sin and, and receiving you into their lives and turning their lives over to your Lordship. And God, I pray that this would be a powerful day. Bless every family, bless every mom, and, and thank you, Lord, for that gift of motherhood. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus.